first of all, thank you all so much. Um, I'm really so honored. So many of you volunteered, and I'm sure a handful of you were volunteered. Um, but I'm so blown away by how many people have stepped up um, to, to uh, participate in this uh, new initiative for us. Um, this is really uncharted ground for me and certainly for the department. Um, I really wanted this to feel very un-DOC-like, all right? And what I mean by that is that um, if you look at, at our history, and I'll touch on that, um, I'll touch on that later, um, if you look at our history and look at how historically we've done big initiatives, um, our approach has been very chain of command, top down kind of approach. And frankly, um, that approach is rarely effective in corrections. And so we really have to, to do something different. And I really want you to understand, and again, um, understand why we're here, what we're trying to accomplish. Um, but the key, the number one thing that we're trying to accomplish, our number one goal, our number one focus is what you see on the top line there, and that's violence reduction. All right, every single thing that we do as a department is focused on this. Every th single decision we make, every single step of this process, the end goal, what we're gonna measure, what we're gonna expect is to reduce violence in our facilities, first of all, because that's what we control, but ultimately in the community. And when people leave us with a skill set of things like conflict resolution and those kinds of things, when they leave us less likely to commit a crime, then we're really achieving our, our goal of public safety. At the same time, when you talk about ad seg and, and more specifically our use of restrictive housing or, or level five housing, um, at the same time, within the context of reducing violence, we want to reduce our use of restrictive housing. Now, why would we do that? Well, the reality is that nationally, there's a lot of pressure around corrections. And frankly, some of it um, coming from the field itself, from the corrections directors, around how much we've used restrictive housing uh, historically. And again, why do we want to reduce the use of restrictive housing? Because the data says that when we overuse it, people come out of our restrictive housing units worse and by worse, more likely to do the kinds of behaviors that get them in there. So it becomes a vicious cycle. But one thing that this is not, is this is not um, some shell game to try to back end and reduce restrictive housing absent the focus on reducing violence, right? The, the reduction of restrictive housing should be a natural and logical consequence of better outcomes in our facilities should be a logical consequence of reducing violence. All right, and, and you'll see, I'll go over some slides. We've, uh, there's been a, a handful of studies around our use of restrictive housing, and we'll go through that so we all kind of start on a, a common understanding. But understand that there's some people that we put in restrictive housing now, and, and there's some um, for nonviolent offenses that perhaps we could manage other ways. And absent doing that, it won't allow us to do what we need to do with the violent people who need to be locked up. And one of the things that you'll never hear from me, you'll never hear, we're gonna get rid of restrictive housing. Certainly there's some systems who said that nobody can spend more than one year in restrictive housing, all right? Absolute, no more than one year. I don't believe in anything absolute. I don't think it's good practice to, to kind of arbitrarily pick a, t pick a time frame like a year and say, okay, Nobody's going behind this, all right? I think sometimes we need to have some people locked up, some maybe forever, very small number. And if you look at our system with 50,000 inmates, we have about 85 people on restrictive release. Trust me, there's not a court in America we can't defend that approach. By the same token, even with that group, we need to look at how to better manage it, how to have our response to their inappropriate behavior factor in taking steps to reduce their future likelihood of doing something horrible inside our facilities. And that's, so that's really the, the kind of broad 
and a philosophical driving force behind what we're doing. Now, in addition to that, one of the key things that, that's, that's going to drive this is that the national standards, the American Correctional Association standards around the use of restricted housing are changing. In January, we're going to see our first draft of the new proposed standards. In August, we're going to vote on those new standards. As soon as I get the draft, everyone in this, in this uh, room and, and as part of this initiative will get a copy of it. But there are some, some items that I know are going to be in there, or at least some areas that, that it's going to address. And the first one is the definition of restrictive housing, and specifically the definition of long-term restrictive housing. How that is going to def be defined as anybody who's in restrictive housing longer than two weeks. That doesn't sound really long-term to me, and if you look at our numbers, um, that means pretty much everyone who gets discipline as a re discipline that involves restrictive housing as a result of behavior would be considered long-term restrictive housing. All right? So when I say that these standards are going to be field changing, they're going to be field changing. And so rather than us be in a, in a reactive mode, um, I really want us to be in a proactive mode and kind of be the author of our own change, which is, has kind of been a theme of ours, but, um, but to be honest, We've been the author of our own change after we've been forced to change. This time, we're hoping to get a little ahead of the curve. And I'm sure, I hope, that there's some people who are skeptical of this. Because if there's no one in here who's skeptical, um, then we did a poor job of, of choosing who to be in here. And if you came here uh, assuming that this was going to be the, the standard DOC, again, top down, rank in the room, effort, um, again, you're miscast. These subgroups, these committees, are designed for real input, and if your committee has no arguments, um, you're not doing the job that we expect you to do. And at the end of this process, hopefully six months-ish, if we come out of here with new policies that are bad policies, then we all failed, all right? I don't know where we're gonna end up. If this was your standard uh, kind of deal, you guys would all be here. We'd flash up on the board the policies with the numbers and all that stuff, and then we'd somehow try to uh, convince you to drink the Kool-Aid and go talk, talk your coworkers into buying in. That is not what this is. This is figuring out how to achieve a reduction in restrictive housing within the context of reducing violence in our facilities in a manner that we think is good correctional practices. And I will tell you that there's not a system in the country that's not looking at this, but I will also tell you I'm not familiar with another system whose focusing, whose primary focus in reducing restrictive housing is reducing violence. And so for that, I think we have the opportunity to really set the tone and set the pace and add another um, voice or perspective um, to this national conversation around the use of restrictive housing or solitary confinement, depending on who's writing the articles. And I think it's the voice of good corrections. And that's our role as Pennsylvania, to be the voice of good corrections and to set the pace uh, for the country. So again, I hope we have a room full of skeptics. And I hope that, uh, that some of you are saying, you know, I'm not sure that I buy that we can reduce violence and reduce restrictive housing at the same time, because they sound uh, inconsistent with each other. They sound like they're competing interests. And I've been in corrections for a long time too. And I know that, that in our heads, our response to inappropriate behavior is lock them up and really inappropriate behavior, lock them up for longer and longer. All right, and I get that. But one of the, one of the coolest things about this department is that when we empower um, facilities, when we de empower departments, when we empower staff to really be able to, to make changes and to uh, do creative things, we get great outcomes. And uh, to start this, to, to um, have you start wrapping your head around this notion that there's other ways we can do stuff and still achieve what we want to achieve 
um, I want to highlight um, the work that's been done at SCI Forest uh, around reducing violence and reducing incidents. And so I've asked um, uh, Deputy Oberlander to come in and just give you a highlight. If you're not familiar with uh, what they've done, um, it's really impressive work that started at Forest, wasn't top down, wasn't driven by uh, Mechanicsburg, it was driven by Forest in response um, to increase violence in their facilities. So Deputy, if you mind coming up, I, I think I, I let him know Friday, I was hoping that he would do this, so uh, when you talk about people being volunteered for things, thank you for allowing me to volunteer you. Thank you sir. All right. Let's do the job though. Get it. I'm gonna stick this right in the pocket if you don't mind. Thank you. All right, good morning, can you hear me? Good thing the podiums, I get anxiety, so if I fall over, I'll be okay in a few seconds. But, uh, so I'm glad the secretary put the microphone back up here for me. Um, we, in August of 2014, uh, matter of fact, it was the day of the volunteer banquet uh, down here. We were down here and we had a serious staff assault. Uh, in, inmate Montana Bell uh, stabbed two of our officers. And that was kind of the culmination of a three month period at Forest between May and August where we saw a significant increase in inmate in, on inmate and inmate on staff violence. Um, we went back on, on Sunday and Superintendent Overmark, <clears throat> we were in the facility, we were locked down, the entire institution was locked down. Superintendent Overmark said we got to do something to reduce the violence here. It's, it's an issue, it's a problem. So we, we formed a committee and our first committee meeting was on August 29th and one of the things that really made uh, our strategy work was, as the secretary said, it wasn't top down, it was everybody. We had staff from every job classification in the institution participate on our committee. And the buy-in was overwhelming. They wanted a safe and secure facility, so the buy-in from staff and the ideas that the staff brought to the table were unbelievable. Um, so we, we had our first meeting in August on the 29th. We set a goal to submit a strategy to the superintendent by the end of September. Uh, our mission was to reduce violence and create a safe and secure facility for staff and offenders. So we first thing we did is look to do some research and if you Google, you're not going to find, you know, the arbiter, arbiter of, of great knowledge, Google, you're not going to find a lot of research on violence reduction strategies for correctional facilities. And one promising strategy that we found was in Washington State. Uh, back in 2011, they implemented a strategy called Operation Play Safety. And just to give you a little background on Operation Place Safety, it was modeled after uh, Operation Ceasefire, which was a policing strategy, a problem-oriented policing strategy that was implemented in Boston in the late 90s. And if you do research on it, you'll see that between 1987 and 1990, Boston had an increase of 230 percent in their youth homicide rate. So uh, victims 24 and under, so 230 percent increase. The Boston Police Department and the community leaders reached out to uh, the Harvard School of Government and they met up with Dr. David Kennedy and they developed this strategy that provided swift, certain, and meaningful. And we all know that those terminology, swift, certain, and meaningful. And it was a strategy that not only targeted the perpetrators of the violent acts but also their close associates because the majority of the homicides were the direct result of gang activity and drug interdiction. So they developed this strategy, they implemented it. Two years after Operation Ceasefire was implemented in Boston, they reduced their homicide rate by 63%, so it proved effective. So in 2011, uh, Washington State, at their Western Penitentiary, which is a maximum security facility in Walla Walla, which has the highest concentration of gang members in the state, reached out to Dr. Kennedy to see if they could model Operation Ceasefire to a correctional environment. And they successfully came up with a strategy and they targeted the most serious, what they call prohibited violent acts, which is an inmate on inmate assault where either weapons used or displayed, an inmate on inmate assault where there are three or more offenders involved in it, or an inmate on staff assault where there's intent to cause or serious bodily injury. Um, and based on that, they came up with this strategy that would provide swift, certain, and meaningful responses to those violent acts. And basically what that entails is that they would lock down the affected area for 36 hours and then they would reach out and identify if it was a gang related incident. If it was, they would seek to identify their close associates. So not only would they impose sanctions on the perpetrator, but they imposed restrictions on their close associates. And two years after Operation Workplace Safety was implemented, it reduced their 
their gang violence in their institutions by 50 percent. So we said that's that's worthy of a study that we should look at and try to implement some of that. So we used, and Carly Kujith, who was a, the Correction Classification Program Manager at, Wall, at the Western Penitentiary, was uh, incredible. She, she, we did conference calls with her, with our committee. Uh, she sent us their, their policy. She sent us their report. She sent us all the data that they had on it. So we used that as the foundation of our strategy. And then we wanted to look at, okay, so in addition to not only a deterrent strategy, what could we do to possibly predict uh, incidents of violence? Because any of you that have uh, attended one of Mr. John Fox, who's the chief hearing exam for parole, his, his uh, presentations always say if it's predictable, it's preventable. So we wanted to look at what is something that we could do to, to identify these offenders and using the risk, need, responsivity, what could we do to, to target them? And we looked at some research. We found that some of the key indicators are age, 25 and under is a good predictor of potential for violence, history of drug use while incarcerated, uh, history of violent offenses, history of engaging in self-injurious behavior, um, affiliation in a gang. Uh, so we looked at those and we came up with what we call our PRC risk need review, which is part of our policy. So if we have an offender who's placed in pre-hearing confinement for an assault weapon, extort to uh, threat of violence, aggravated assault, uh, contraband for a weapon or a fight, we generate our risk need review. And what happens is the counselors at the facility will take the, the form and they'll go through and look for those eight indicators and they'll complete the form for PRC. When we meet with the offender, then we're able to give them a score. So five or more is considered high. So we try to target those individuals and see what we need to do whether when they're released from the RHU, if we put them on PRC tracking, or we go to what's called our step down unit, which is another component of it. So we came up with what's called the risk need review, and then we also have risk minimization plans. So it's kind of like an IRP. Uh, and Dr. Bloom, who's here today, she actually runs the groups on our step down unit. When we do a risk minimization plan, she meets with them and she asks them some of the goals or things that contributed to the violent behavior and what we could work on to reduce that. So the offender is involved in that process as well. So we're able to not only say, okay, here's who's at risk, here's some things that we can do to minimize that. So the risk need review was something that was in addition to the foundation that we got from Washington State. Uh, and then the next component of it's our step down unit. So we have a step down unit that um, when we release them from the RHU, we place them on the step down unit. It's a 60 day program, each step's 20 days, and it's incentive based. So they get incentives as they progress through each step to give them uh, the incentives to go. They also in, attend two hours of cognitive-based intervention uh, each week. So most of these offenders that were released and from the RHU are, are not short men. They're not on any type of priority for program placement. So when they come out, they're getting some CBI and we're trying to see what the effects of that. I think to date, we've released 91 offenders from the RHU to our step down. 57 is, have successfully completed it and I think four or five have returned to the RHU since successful completion. So we came up, our goal again was to submit this strategy to the superintendent by the end of September, I think around the middle of October. We, we came up with our strategy and we submitted it. And then we want to thank the secretary and EDS and the RDSs uh, who gave us permission to go ahead and pilot um, our strategy. And also Mr. Perez, who's legal, uh, team did an outstanding job of reviewing our procedure um, because it's it stood up to the test of time so far. We're not violating any liberty interests. Um, we've had three inmates, I think, of the 91 released this step-down unit have grieved being placed on the step-down unit following placement in the RHU. So it's, uh, and I don't think any of those grievances have went to SOIGA. So again, that's a testament to whole team effort and coming up with this strategy. Um, we also, part of our strategy though is the, the swift, certain and meaningful sanction. So our offenders know, and what we did, what a key part of our, our strategy was once we got permission to implement the pilot is that we did what's called a call-in. And that was something that we took from Washington State. So we actually forced as a prototypical, we, we took one day in the morning, we called 100 offenders from our east side, we brought them into the chapel, we gave them a presentation, we told them how we came up with this strategy, we told them what we were going to do. And some of the inmates that were uh, invited to participate were key leaders in the STG groups, they were uh, our inmate organization Hope for Change, we had block reps, uh, and then other inmates uh, from the housing units that we felt could go back and relay this message of what we were going to do 
when one of these prohibitive violent acts was committed. So we brought them over, um, we gave them a presentation, told them that moving forward, if they committed one of these prohibitive violent acts, we were going to lock down the affected unit for 36 hours. Instead of the whole institution, we are just targeting the specific housing unit. Uh, we were also going to, um, if it was a gang, determined to be a gang-related incident, we were going to identify close associates and if successfully ID'd, that we'd be imposing restrictions on them. And the way we do that is it's, we send out, when a prohibitive violent act occurs, we send out a, a close associate form to the entire institution. So we get feedback from teachers, from psych, uh, from medical, from activities, from all over the institution on who these inmates are associating with. So our security office sees a benefit because they're getting real-time intel now uh, when we identify these close associates. Someone that they might not think are interacting together, they're seeing interaction between inmates. So it's been a positive in that light also. And then we have our security office and a member of our committee sit down. If we see multiple names on multiple close associate forms, then we identify them as a close associate and we impose restrictions, which can be uh, restricting them from main yard, taking away their telephone privileges, they're reducing their visits to one visit a month, uh, except for legal visits. So. We've also successfully done that. We've had one grievance uh, from an inmate who had restrictions imposed on him. So we brought him over. We told him, here's what's going to happen. Uh, for the most part, the feedback that we got from the inmates was positive. They didn't want to be uh, subjected to the violence, the majority of them at the institution either. Um, the, the biggest, I guess, uh, complaint that we got is that they weren't able to provide feedback in our strategy and how we developed it. So we did that in January. Uh, we started it on January 23rd, we, we did the call in and we brought 80 offenders over from the west side, gave the presentation, sent memos out to all the housing units, put it on our uh, inmate information channel and we started our strategy and we did a, uh, we just recently did our eight month report uh, for the RDS and submitted it and since we've implemented this, <clears throat> when we're comparing, what we wanted to do is take a snapshot to see is it effective? Is it working? What we're doing? So we looked at <clears throat> time periods between January and August of 2014 versus January and August of 2015. And just to give you some of the indicators that we're seeing so far, when we compare those two time periods, we had a 31.9% decline in misconducts for assault. We went from 122 when we looked at that time period in January 2014, or the 2014 time period versus the 2015, we had 83. Uh, we had 29.4% decline in misconducts for fighting, so we went from 78 to 55. Uh, for medical incident injury reports, we went from 822 to 536, that's for staff. Medical incident injury reports for inmates, we went from 804 in 2014 to 510 in 2015. Uh, one of our big indicators, uh, admin separation transfers, we went from 69 to 29. Um, EORs, we went from 349 to 245. So the, the early indicators for us is that it's promising. It, um, we still have a lot to do. We, when we did our eight-month report, we had 21 prohibited violent acts. We added a fourth, which I didn't cover. We added anything that the, where we have an inmate, it may be an inmate on inmate fight, but requires outside hospitalization. The superintendent has the ability to make the call if that was determined to be a prohibited violent act. In the eight months <clears throat> when we did our report, we had 21 prohibited violent acts at the institution. Ten of them were STG related. Five of them were C roster inmates who were not med compliant. And then the balance were just other inmates. So one of the, the research that we also saw is that 71% of staff assaults are reactionary. So if you look at some of your assaults at your facility, take a look at that. They're reactionary, 15% are spontaneous, 14% are premeditated. Uh, so some of the, again, the data that we're, we still have a long way to go. Uh, we want to work now on targeting the, the C roster inmates who aren't med compliant, who are behavioral issues. A lot of them have the, the uh, 301.7 antisocial personality disorder diagnosis that we're seeing. Um, but again, it's, it's a total team effort. Um, we have Usually our, we meet monthly, our committee meets monthly. We have anywhere from 25 to 30 staff that come up for the committee meetings. Um, it's, a, it's been effective because of that, because of everybody's buy-in and, and willingness to, to offer their ideas and, and staff at the top not being afraid to let those staff implement the great ideas and suggestions that they brought to the table. So 
again, I want to thank the Secretary for giving us a chance with it. So, thank you. Well, now you see why I, I tapped them today. Um, I think there's a lot as a, as a department we can learn uh, from this approach. And first of all, uh, data-driven. If you think about uh, your facility and think about assaults that occurred, especially assaults on staff, um, you hear how um, Forrest has really analyzed uh, trying to figure out what, it dri what drove the assaults and more importantly, looking for commonalities. And I love, um, I love this, the, the concept of what we can predict, we can prevent. Because that's really what this is all about. I think that some, another lesson we can learn is um, bottom up. Line staff, not being threatened um, by having uh, line staff meaningfully involved in how we formulate our approach. Every one of us has a vested interest. I mean, there's a reason why we're not in uh, uniform today um, because in, in this room, in these committees, uh, rank is not uh, what's important. What's important is that every one of you um, bring your own perspective and bring expertise. And so this is really about, the, what, what you saw at Forest is really our vision of, of this, uh, how this will process over the, the coming months. So let me kind of, I really want to contextualize this effort uh, kind of in the history of, of DOC. And, and we talked about kind of how uh, DOC has changed um, since certainly at least the, the late 80s. And, and one of the terms that in the field we use for bad events is sentinel events, right? Key events that really change our approach. And if you look at how this department has changed, and it certainly has changed over the, the past uh, couple decades, it really, the change has been driven by sentinel events. And certainly, uh, everyone in this department uh, would remember, or at least have heard about, the, the Camp Hill riots in 1989. And the one thing you absolutely can say is what, this department is very good at, after a bad event happens, responding and making the changes you need so it doesn't happen again, right? And, and we kind of call that fail forward, right? Bad event happens, all right, let's figure out why it happened, let's make the adjustments, and, and that's, that's what good organizations do, make adjustments. Uh, what great organizations do is understand when the environment has changed and make the change before we have a set no event. So this, the, the Camp Hill riots in 1989 changed this department significantly. When you talk about from a security standpoint, when you look at things like uh, special teams, when you look at all the different vulnerability assessments, security assessments. Areas like that, we, we are truly leading the, comp the country. It came as a response to this. So the good news is, bad event happened, we adjusted, and we improved as a result of that. But if you were an individual who was involved in that, I'm guessing that you would say, damn, it would have been nice if we identified this stuff before we had to go through that, right? Another big sentinel event for our department, especially as it relates to population. Parole moratorium in, in 2009, right? Couple, um, couple people get out, uh, get out of DOC, kill uh, some police officers in Philadelphia. The mayor, uh, or the governor at the time, Governor Rendell's at a press conference. Someone asked him a question about um, the parolees killing somebody. He says, we're gonna close parole. Didn't check with every, anybody, uh, just made the call at a press conference at the airport. That decision resulted in a 20, about a 2,500 inmate increase in our department that we're just getting over now. 2,500 resulted in us shipping 2,000 inmates out of state, uh, resolved in a bunch of uh, construction projects, sentinel event outside of our control. Now again, did we respond? Absolutely. 
big focus. Matter of fact, one of, one of uh, Governor Corbett's focuses was reducing population, responding to the Sentinel event and, and taking a different approach. Good news is we have less inmates now than we had then. Um, so yeah, we responded. Another um, big Sentinel event that I'm pretty sure everyone in this room um, will remember is getting sued by a Disability Rights Network and Department of Justice. Now, this happened in 2012. I believe it may have started late 2011. Certainly in 2012, uh, we were under tremendous scrutiny. And as you'll remember, the, the uh, allegation was that we overused uh, restrictive housing or isolation or solitary confinement, whatever you want to call it. We'll use the term restrictive housing just so we're on the same page. Um, we overused it for mentally ill offenders, and the fact that we overused it actually made them worse. And the reality was that allegation was accurate. And it wasn't that there was this uh, conspiracy theory to do it. Uh, you know, there's this quote that says, when the only tool you have in your tool chest is a hammer, um, every problem's a nail. And that's really where we were at. So someone behaved inappropriately. We didn't necessarily ask a follow-up question. We didn't necessarily try to understand why, like they're doing in Forest now for violent events. We just said, okay, if you're gonna do A, then B's gonna happen, and B involves uh, going to the hole. And then that, the, um, the experience of seriously mentally ill individuals in our restrictive housing units made them worse, made them more violent, made them more likely to hurt themselves. The number and the data backed all this stuff up. But again, when you talk about our response, when you talk about fail forward, we made significant changes quickly. I mean, at light speed, right? Probably by August of 2013, um, we had made the policy and structural changes on how we were gonna respond to inappropriate behavior uh, by mentally ill offenders. We also increased our mental health infrastructure and all this stuff. But we did it in a reactionary mode in a fail forward with a gun to our head and quickly. And if we could have uh, been proactive, if we could have uh, projected that um, this was the new trend in corrections, and frankly, we should have projected that. Because if you look at these kinds of lawsuits, all you gotta do is read the paper because it starts somewhere and then you see lawsuits all over the place. I'll give you an illustration. Recently, the ACLU sued the Department of Human Services because of the wait for jail inmates um, until they can get into a forensic mental health bed. If you Google it, you'll see at least one other state, and I believe two, with similar, similar lawsuits. So that's really how this field uh, is often changed. It's changed through a lawsuit here, and then uh, you see lawsuits replicated. Well, the first system that was significant, the first two systems that were sued significantly for a response to mentally offenders, New York, who made significant changes to their system. Actually, we hired their experts to be our experts. Um, California, who actually went into federal receivership. And what federal receivership means is that their department doesn't control when they hire, who they hire, how they spend their money, a federal receiver does. And Massachusetts, whose, whose lawsuit was almost identical to ours from the Disability Rights Network. So because of that, we, we should have been able to project, which we didn't, but we were able to learn from their lessons and make the changes. Now I suggest to you that this initiative, that what, what we're doing right now, what you're doing, sitting in this room right now, is a sentinel event for this department. And I would suggest to you that this is the point in our time, in our history, where we're making a decision to become proactive. Now a year from now, we're gonna have to make some changes anyhow, right? But I'd rather make changes that we think are good practices within this context of reducing violence as opposed to responding to a change in um, standards that we roll out quickly and haphazardly and the result of that is people getting hurt and staff getting hurt. What's at stake here is significant. What's at stake here is the safety of our coworkers, the safety of inmates, and the safety of the community. And that's not hyperbole, it's not an exaggeration. We're not Walmart, if something gets mislabeled at Walmart, maybe you can't find it when you go shop. When we make errors, when we make errors in policy, when we make errors in procedure, 
when we make errors in implementation, people get hurt. And I don't want to be in a situation where there's a gun to our head and we're being forced to make significant changes to how we do business, driven by the outside. Too much at stake, too much respect for the, the men and women uh, who walk inside our facilities every day to do that. So this is a Sentinel event and I hope that this informs how we move forward on major initiatives. I hope that uh, we're, that we stick to this, that we have the courage, that we have enough foresight that when we have to do big changes or when we want to do big changes or when um, the system dictates that something's different and we need to respond, that we take the time to get our staff, all of our staff involved and be a voice of that change. And it's okay for uh, someone who's in leadership position for this agency to say what we need to do. That's okay. That's what, what our job is as, as leaders of this organization. But when the leaders of the organization say how that change should work, it doesn't work. So the what is reduce violence. The what is reduce our use of restrictive housing. The how, you tell me. So I, I talked to you a little bit about uh, some of the national efforts around this uh, use of restrictive housing. And there was a study done that was actually commissioned by ASCA. And ASCA is the group of all the corrections administrators in the Commonwealth, so, or in the country. So all 50 corrections directors, and I believe there's five directors from big systems like LA, New York City, Philadelphia, Chicago, and maybe uh, Virgin Islands or something, something like that. Um, all the directors and and we got together a couple years ago and with some outside pressure some inside pressure and some frustration around um, understanding that we had uh, bad events happening in our facility we had uh, staff getting assaulted and the reality is a lot of this stuff around corrections reform which is a trend that's happening nationally a lot of the reducing population oddly enough um, results in a higher average level of classification for the people inside, right? So when we divert, when you look at, at our population that's down uh, over the past three years by about 1,400 inmates, give or take, um, those 1,400 inmates are uh, disproportionately lower classification inmates. So that means that the inmates um, that are here, the inmates that will get, the inmates that will keep, the ones who will stay longer, are more apt to be violent. Right? So that should signal to us that it, it's really important to, to make these changes. And that really signaled to the corrections directors that we really need to look at this in context of, um, of this changing environment. And also understanding on the horizon after uh, the series of lawsuits around mentally ill offenders and restrictive housing that it's likely to deduce, it's, it's logical to deduce um, that there's going to be pressure around the overall use of restrictive housing. So we did a study, and I don't know, is this on our website? The, the, it's on the AdSeg page? Yeah, so we have an AdSeg page on the website. Um, and all these reports are on here. I'll also uh, send Sue a copy of this PowerPoint, and we'll put it on there. Um, I want to thank uh, Dr. Buckland for making these slides up to just highlight some of the things from these reports. And this really looks at the use of uh, restrictive housing. And at that point in time, Almost 5% of our population um, was in some form of restrictive housing, with about 2% being uh, ad seg. And, and so the category, the district, uh, restrictive housing is a broad catchphrase for anybody who's in a segregation unit. Ad seg versus disciplinary custody, right? Those are the two, um, those are the two classifications. So if you look at our population, about 5% at the time, I believe that's 3.9% now, uh, somewhere in that ballpark. And the difference between the 4.8 and the 3.9, probably a big piece of that is the modifications we made to the D roster and, and getting D roster folks um, that 20 hours out of your cell. So then now would be a great uh, time to define what we're talking about when we're talking about restrictive housing. And so in the context of, of problem solving, in the context of the work that, that your committees are going to do, 
understand that long-term restrictive housing, that's the term that's going to be in the standards, so that's really what we're going to focus on, is generally um, people who are in segregation longer than 14 days, all right? So under 14 days, it's not considered long-term restrictive housing. Um, so what that may translate to is some of the solutions, especially for nonviolent offenses, could be um, a kind of quick dip approach where we can um, lock people up for nonviolent offenses for a short period of time, but make sure we do it consistently every time. Um, that approach actually is gonna be piloted at Somerset. Um, and and the, the person who came up with that approach, uh, Dr. Mark Kleiman, um, is working with us through a research shop to pilot that. Um, so it's less than 14 days, it's not long-term restrictive housing. The other consistent thing is out of cell time, right? So with our D roster inmates, they have the opportunity to be out of their cell 20 hours a week. That is not, that does not meet the criteria for long-term restricted housing. All right, so some may say, well, let's just have everybody in the RHU out uh, 20 hours a week. Reality is we can't afford it. If we did that today, um, think about the staff load and for the D roster facilities, I see a lot of head nodding. Um, when we first made these changes, one of the things that we underestimated was how many uh, correctional staff we needed to deliver the out of cell time, 20 hours out of cell time uh, for just 8% of our population. So uh, doing that for 100% of our population, not gonna happen, right? So it has to be some combination of the two, but keep in mind, length of stay, and out of cell time are kind of the two key figures in what's uh, long-term restrictive housing versus what's not. If you look at the percentages around the country, I think the variance is from a low of 2% to a high of 22% of the population long-term restrictive housing. So, um, it, you know, if you lay it out on the bell curve, certainly we're down at the low end. Although the reality is this is not the kind of issue I care to compare to other systems. We need to do what makes sense for our system. And we come up with a solution, we'll defend it. And if those of you who are involved in the major changes we made to the mental health system, we took the same approach. We took that report from Department of Justice and the allegations from the Disability Rights Network. We looked at what we agreed with, we made the changes to that. Um, and then we defended the things we didn't agree with. Um, one of the other focuses of this study was around um, how much time people spend in ad seg and especially how the, the longer stays. Um, and in our case, 40% uh, uh, spend more than 90 days in ad seg. And so if we, we overlay uh, what violent offenses and, and like for instance the prohibited offenses at Forest, um, I'm guessing that that wouldn't add up to 40% of our misconducts, right? So a piece of this, as we're looking through the, the subgroup, may be looking at the, our responses to inappropriate behavior as it relates to length of stay, all right? Out of cell time by day. Obviously, the vast majority, 82% of everyone in the country who's an ad seg, um, has very similar um, characteristics to us in that uh, 23, locked in your cell 23 hours a day, uh, and generally also um, that generally happens five days a week. All right, and that's what the next slide looks at. And again, all these slides will be on, on the website, all the data is on the website. Um, but I'll just say in general, if there's any data, any information that any of the subgroups need, uh, moving forward, um, certainly just roll it up. We'll get you that. We, we tried to spread folks from research all over the subgroups, uh, but we weren't obviously able to have a researcher in every group, but we have the ability. There's no data that you want that you can't have. There's no information uh, that you need to form these strategies that you can't have. In order for us to do this, we can't just talk about being transparent. We can't uh, avoid uncomfortable truths. The only way it's gonna work is if you have every piece of information we have. So if there's some information that you need that you don't have, let us know. Uh, hopefully we can turn around relatively quickly, certainly between subgroup meetings, we can get you almost, um, I, I would think almost whatever you need. 
So then in this department, um, at the same time we were going through the changes from the Disability Rights Network and the Department of Justice, um, we thought it would make sense to bring in the Vera Institute. Um, and Vera um, has been known as the group that has been going around and really analyzing the use of restrictive housing. So we brought them in and, and that was actually kind of a beta or a test for this approach. Because what we did is we put a, a committee together and I'd ask any of the, the committee members who are here if you could stand up briefly um, so folks know who you are. All right, so see the, the, these folks, these are the experts. And for any of you um, who are from the, the, the VERA committee who aren't assigned to a group, pick a group. But this, these, this group is the go-to people. Um, and their report and their response, is their response on our website? You guys can sit down, thank you. Um, they did a lot of work around this, but it was, it was really the it was really an effort to bring all different kinds of staff from all different layers of the org chart to work with the folks at Vera who went out, visited our facilities, tried to understand not just our numbers, but our culture and, and how we do what we do and all that stuff. Um, and they really laid the groundwork for this bigger effort. All right, so some of them are, are already assigned to groups. Some of them are just here as a resource. And, and to the folks who aren't assigned, just bounce around or whatever. This is, um, this whole process is as unstructured as we could possibly make it. I know it drives some of you nuts. Um, I hope it drives some of you nuts. That makes me happy. Um, driving org chart people nuts. Um, but just bounce around. But these folks have, sp have spent um, at least half a year, maybe longer than that, probably closer to a year, um, analyzing our data and trying to apply what the Vera Institute of Justice suggested vers versus what we were comfortable with and what we were capable of. All right? I, I mean... It, I really want to thank Vera for the work they did, but uh, by the same token, um, we don't need New York City uh, solutions for Pennsylvania problems, right? We need their expertise. We, we, it's good to have objective uh, folks analyze to say the what, but the how, we own. So if you look at some of the um, outcomes of their study, hold on, I flipped too many pages past. Uh, if you look at the outcome, oh, I'm a couple behind. There we go. If you look at the outcome of their study, 40% of our inmates in restrictive housing are in administrative custody for a variety of reasons. One of the groups that falls under that in Pennsylvania, and one of the reasons why our numbers, our length of stay numbers are skewed, is because of our death row, our capital case population. Right? Some of them have decades on here. And the one area that is off the table is capital case. At this point, um, we're not looking at any changes to the capital case unit. Maybe that'll come at some point down the road. Um, but if you think of um, restrictive housing reduction as a natural byproduct of violence reduction, uh, capital case don't fall in there. They're a different category. Um, so that's, we don't have a group around, um, we don't have a group around capital case. But when 40% of your population is administrative seg, that suggests that you have at least a portion of that that we could really look at and make sure that the reason we have them in some form of restrictive housing is to achieve the goal of violence reduction and safer prisons, uh, and not just because we've always done it that way, or not just because it's convenient to do that. The second looks at um, inmates who roll over to AC after DC and then spend more than 30 days in AC. And this is, a, this is uh, an area in particular um, that we really need to look at. So if you think of the, the a system and um, how system users, in this case inmates, um, view the system, what, what research suggests is that um, to the more just the system is, the more legitimacy the system is viewed, and the more that inmates greet um, the rules and regulations, right? And I think an example of that um, is, is Forrest and what the outcomes there. One of the, the outcomes uh, the deputy didn't talk about is the reduction in grievances, and we're talking about hundreds 
hundreds less grievances, hundreds. I think it was 400. 400 less grievances in an eight month period by doing this violence reduction, by uh, prohibited uh, defenses. What that suggests to me, that suggests to me that the inmates at Forest are viewing this approach as legitimate. They're viewing uh, Forest Administration's response to inappropriate behavior as just. So when you look at this and say that if you do A, B, and C, you're gonna go to, to disciplinary custody, and then for some other reason, outside of uh, legitimate uh, correctional interest, we're gonna flip you over to AC, and some of it may be we don't have beds in, in general population. Some of it may be we put other processes in place that we don't necessarily have to have in place, but we put it in place to give an additional review even after you've done your DC time. This, again, suggests to me that we have an opportunity to impact our numbers, impact our use of restrictive housing without having a negative impact on the safety of the institutions. When you look at sanctions, you'll see that 75% of our sanctioned um, options, that 75% of the people who go in front of a hearing examiner um, get DC time and restrictive housing. Again, not saying if, if that's what we need to achieve what we're looking for, then that percentage is fine. If we can achieve what we're looking to achieve without this being the only response, maybe this means, and we have a, a group that's looking at sanctions, and maybe this means we need more sanction op. I think one of the things that we would all agree, that we would all benefit for, and an example that we see at Forest with the step-down unit, is that a piece of our response needs to be intervention. So part of this response when you have people who are violent is lock them up and get them away from people who aren't violent, right? That's a piece of it. And incapacitation as a goal for restrictive housing for violent offenders makes perfect sense. But incapacitation, absent trying to address the root cause of the behavior, may buy us some time, but it doesn't make that individual any less likely to commit violence when they get out. So yes, incapacitation needs to be a piece of it, but incapacitation with intervention really needs to be where we need to get to. We have some room to grow in that. Loss of privileges to further kind of hammer that point home. When you look at loss of privileges, um, we don't use that nearly as much as we could. When you look at length of stay or length of sanction, uh, we're generally looking at more than uh, 30 days uh, and 85% of the time. And again, match length of time to violence versus nonviolence. And I know there's gray areas. There's nothing that's simple in corrections, right? I know there's gray areas. But just looking at it globally and saying, if we want to reserve those beds for violent offenders and we want to find some other way to do it, there's room, room to grow. And I don't know what the right percentage of this is, but I know that, and I hope that we'll be able to model, when you guys come up with suggestions, we'll be able to model and make projections um, based on the different policy options. That's uh, further broke down by uh, offense type and those kinds of things. This one is interesting and it really speaks to the, um, after someone does their sanction time, um, a large percentage, a larger percentage than, than I would think, 30% of everybody actually spends more time in DC than the sanctions suggest they should. So if they need to spend more time in DC, then the sanction should be longer, right? But we need to do what we say we're gonna do. This one will surprise absolutely no one, and that's looking by stability type. And we know that, especially um, it, since the changes we made, that C roster group, um, I know initially when we made these changes, the D roster facilities um, were, were um, feel in some kind of way, as Glunt would say. Um, but I think in the feedback we get now, um, I think the C roster facilities are uh, understanding that that is the difficult uh, group of inmates. And that's the group we really need to uh, really do a better job of identifying. And when you talk about some of the characteristics of people likely um, to get in trouble, we have a group that's, that's specifically just looking at that looking at who's likely to commit violence in our facilities and what can we do before they uh, assault someone. This slide looks 
and, and talks about STGMates, and they're about uh, three times more likely to be in AC or DC custody. And I would say good, and if we can make them three, four, five, or six times, um, if they're a gang member and they're creating havoc in our facilities, that's what restrictive housing uh, should be for. Again, focused on reducing the behavior, but an important piece of it to keep our staff and other inmates safe. So as we start wrapping this up, I want you to understand that, that, um, that this is just not lip service. That this process, you're not down here um, just because we're arbitrarily going to do this and try to stay ahead of those standards. When the Wolf administration uh, came on board, one of the first things they asked us to do was come up with three metrics, three things that we were going to put out there as part of our budget that was going to, one, guide our spend, what are we going to spend money on in the budget, and two, outcomes that we could put out publicly um, that we were going to work to impact. And this, we were asked to do this early on in the administration, like February. And these are the three uh, performance metrics that we're going to be held accountable for uh, by the administration, ultimately by the public. Population reduction, recidivism reduction, and violence reduction inside our prisons. Beginning of this administration, we targeted this as a key goal. That's why you're here. To say that we're going to reduce restrictive housing within the context of violence reduction, it's the only way we can do it. And the next two slides are really going to give you uh, an indication of why this is so critical. We've had a bad year for violence inside our facilities. And there's probably uh, a bunch of reasons why, um, but the reality is the numbers, the last, this year, 2015, are headed in the wrong direction. And um, just to contextualize that, if you look at uh, assaults, major assaults on staff by inmates, and, and this uh, scale, it's um, the rate per 1,000 inmates. So that means that if our population goes up or down, it's not just a raw number, right? It's a percentage based on the actual population. Um, and what you'll see is historically, we've stayed between a low of, of 0.06 and a high of one for at least since 2008, really stayed uh, within that band. This year, um, assaults are heading in the wrong direction. Assaults on staff are heading in the wrong direction, all right? It's important that we, we understand why, and we've got Bob Flaherty, who does uh, most of the work around the scam reports and the research department working on it. This uh, piece of data, along with this piece of data, which shows the assaults, uh, inmate on inmate assaults, um, heading in the same direction. And what's interesting is last year, we saw a reduction in assaults on staff and an increase in assaults, inmate on inmate assaults. This 2015, both numbers are going up. Right? So when we talk about uh, committee structure, the Violence Reduction Committee, this is really your focus. And this is really what we're going to measure our system by. So um, I want you to get the big picture of how this is all supposed to work. So we formed, there's basically three, um, three bands of um, committees. The first one is the Violence Reduction Committee. That's chaired by Dr. Buckland. Um, Dr. Buckland or Brett or Buck or whatever you want to call him um, is chairing this because this really has to be data driven. But many of you are on this and unlike the ad seg, there's no subcommittees formed. In the, the, the ad seg committees uh, or restrictive housing committees, we broke it down into a bunch of subgroups we didn't form subgroups around this violence reduction because we don't know what subgroups would make sense. So your task is really to, um, to have a good facilitated discussion around um, violence that's occurring and around what our response is going to be. And the subgroups, uh, you're going to really develop what subgroups and what areas you want to specifically look at. Now I'll say in general for all these subgroups, uh, one of the things that is at your disposal is the ability to pilot um, what you want to try. 
Um, while this is certainly going to be a bottom-up, uh, committee-driven process, uh, your chair is just going to bounce that up through uh, the regional deputies to get sign-off. Um, if you want to try to a specific facility or you don't know a facility, another mechanism to bounce it up through the regional deputies is to pick a facility. Um, but I anticipate seeing a, a bunch of pilots around here. And one of the things that, that I'm really going to ask, though, is when we're doing a pilot, that we, we write it up well and we can put measurements on it from the research department right from the beginning. Because if we pilot a bunch of stuff, as good as you all are, some of them aren't, ain't going to work. All right. So it's important that we structure the pilot in a manner that we can analyze it and make sure we're heading in the direction we're looking to head in. So that's violence reduction. The next uh, subgroup is going to be chaired by uh, Deputy Winerowitz, and he's really going to—it's his job to really pull all these uh, groups together into one um, effort here. And so we have the classification process group that's chaired by Ross Miller. We look about, look at proactively identifying people who are likely to assault staff or other inmates. Ideally, we would do that right at uh, commitment. And anything's on the table. So if we can accurately identify or relatively accurately identify people who are likely to commit an assault, and we think that that requires another program, so similar to um, what Pine Grove does with, with the uh, YAOs and, and Muncie. Pine Grove and Muncie do with YAOs. So let's identify this group likely to be violent. Let's create a program where they're all going to have to go through. And maybe it's, it's a really structured, really kind of slow rolling process that has a lot of programming. And, and maybe it's a, an incentive base that they have to earn their out of cell time or something. That's on the table. But first, we got to identify. Because what we can identify, we can address. Second group is the sanction option group. Uh, Superintendent uh, Wingert from uh, Somerset is chairing that. And I know most of the subcommittees have already gotten together uh, via video conference. Really looking at what our options are. Uh, one of the reasons he's cha chairing it um, is because they're going to pilot the uh, swift and certain quick dip approach. Um, that's a, an exa example of a sanctioning option um, for potentially nonviolent or for maybe for violent. I don't know what that's going to end up being. Um, but we need to think broadly. And one of the things I don't want anybody to get fettered in is what we're doing today. If we're doing something today and it works, we should absolutely keep it. If we're doing something today and it doesn't work, get rid of it. All right. One of the things we often forget about here is that we write the policy. And that our answer all the time is, well, policy says you can't do that. We write, look, we change policies, what, 800 times a year? So we can certainly uh, change policy if it doesn't make sense. <laughs> I may be exaggerating a little bit, but not much. <laughs> the next group is programming. And one of the things specifically that we need to do is program violent offenders while they're in the restrictive housing unit. Now, this doesn't necessarily mean that we have to do like we do in the D-roster facilities with the, uh, what do you call them, therapeutic modules. Um, it could start with in-cell programming. A lot of systems do that. A lot of systems have, or some systems I know, have a completely separate. So if you're a violent offender, you actually get moved to another facility. Um, generally, smaller systems do that with 26 facilities and we already transport, what, 900,000 people a week or whatever we're transporting. I'm not sure that's going to be necessarily a viable option. Uh, however, again, nothing is off the table. Um, and that Tracy Smith is heading that up. The conditions of confinement, just looking broadly at the conditions of confinement are restrictive housing units. Um, I, I hope that this group will explore opportunities for technology um, as part of that. We'll also look at out of cell time, um, and that's headed up by Superintendent Ferguson. The training and culture committee. This is going to be a key part of this initiative because this isn't, I'm, I'm not looking for this effort to be a, a force fed, read this, this is what we're doing now effort. I'm looking for this. We have enough time to do this right. And by right, uh, structure it in a manner that makes sense that's focused on outcomes, that's developed uh, collectively in a participatory manner, but also rolled out or implemented 
in a manner where staff understand what we're doing, why we're doing it, and how we're going to do it. And we don't do that nearly enough. And I'll point to the, our efforts around um, the D roster inmates as an effort that probably made sense the way we did it, but we certainly could have done better with implementation. And if we had more time, I would hope that we would have done it this manner. So that committee is, is going to be really key in looking at and understanding the culture and understanding the concerns of staff and understanding and making sure that, that the changes we're making are consistent with the culture that we want to have and that staff understand it and understand what we're trying to accomplish. And uh, Dooley's going to head that up. And then the group around long-term segregation. Uh, and I'm glad, so, uh, Nancy, I, I assume you came up with that name, because we were calling this group the worst of the worst, but that doesn't look great on paper. Um, but it, in, in the emails I've gotten around this, and I've gotten a lot of emails around this, and some of you, the reason you're on this group is because anybody who sent me an email um, up until about two weeks ago, uh, I just put you on the group if you wanted to. And some people said, no, I just wanted to send you an email. I don't want to be on the group. Um, but this is the, the group that everybody's concerned about. And this is the group where, um, they, this is the group who spends the most time in disciplinary segregation. This is the group who uh, is the most harmful. Part of this group is restrictive release. And the emails I generally get are, what do you do with these guys? And m my response um, is pretty simple. First of all, we shouldn't be setting all our disciplinary all our restrictive housing approach to the worst of the worst. I told you we have 88 people or 85 people on restrictive release out of 50,000. That shouldn't be what we set restrictive housing around. But we need to be able to identify the people who are truly dangerous. We need to find a way to keep them incapacitated as long as they're with us. But the other component, and the one thing that's going on around the country that I absolutely agree with, is we have to figure out what to do with this group who are getting out of our prisons. So, I, you know, back before this budget impasse, when, when I was getting out to facilities and we started talking about this, um, one of the things I said to pretty much every superintendent was, we have to stop releasing people from restrictive housing into the community. And the response across the board is, yeah, but the people who are, who, who are maxing out from the hole, they're, they're the worst people in our system. What can we do with them? And my response is simple. Okay, they're the worst people in our system. What can we do uh, with them? We're going to take them handcuffed and shackled, sometimes on tape, commissioned officer there. We're going to walk them up. Then we're going to uncuff them and put them on the bus next to Aunt Faye, right? And then when a bad event happens, how do we explain that? Or forget a bad event, ha forget about how we explain it. How do we explain it to that family? Right? This is not going to be easy. It's, not e it's easy for me to say, I don't want anybody released from restrictive housing. It is not easy to deliver that. But we have to figure something out. We can't re responsibly release people, especially people who spent years, if not decades, in restrictive housing and expect them to move back to the community and be successful, self-actualized citizens. Not going to happen. So I'm really uh, interested in what, what this group in particular will come up with because this is the toughest nut in our system to crack. And while it's the smallest number, when you look at the potential damage to the community, uh, this is the group that we're truly scared of for good reason. All right, so we got to figure that out. The final group um, is headed up by uh, Deputy Secretary Bickle, and I, I think probably co-chaired by both Superintendent uh, Smith and Torma. And this is uh, looking at female offenders. And one of the things that, that you're going to see, um, and maybe some groundbreaking news here, is that females are different than men. Um, and if you looked at our policies, you probably couldn't tell that. Um, but honest to God, there's a difference. Um, and, and one of the things we have to do as a system is start acknowledging that difference. And uh, it's okay to have our female facilities operate under different rules. Look, the sky didn't fall when we talked about it. 
Um, this is really critical. And we started signaling this change with um, different cognitive behavioral approach. Um, there's gonna be different assessment. Uh, the nature of the misconducts, the, even the nature of violence is different in female facilities than it is in male facilities. So this group is going to do everything all the other subcommittees are going to do within their own group. So how this big picture is supposed to work is we have these kind of three legs of this tripod working together and at the back end we're going to have two solutions. We're going to have a solution that represents a, a reduction in restrictive housing and reduction in violence uh, in male facilities and one in female facilities. So all this and all your work and all the subgroups is gonna come together um, hopefully six-ish months from now into a cohesive, well laid out, well thought out, uh, unified plan on what we're gonna do and how we're gonna do it and how we're gonna implement it. And that's the goal. Sounds pretty simple, right? Uh, if it sounds simple, it doesn't sound simple to me, it sounds very complicated. Um, but that's why we have this structure, that's really what we're trying to achieve. So as for the rest of today, um, we're going to go on break now, and then uh, the Academy's going to roll the food in here somewhere at 1130. Um, nice, good Academy type lunch, then this is the breakouts, these are the rooms at the different committees. If you're not assigned to a committee, uh, feel free to go somewhere else. If you want to um, switch committees, just make sure your chairman know. Um, no, skip that part. We're not doing that. Guys. Um, but if you're not assigned to a committee, pick where you want to go. For the folks who are, who are on the Vera group, um, if you, if you want to go to a specific committee, feel free. If you want to bounce from committee to committee, feel free. Uh, Deputy Glunt is also going to be kind of bouncing around. Um, and, and a handful of us are going to be bouncing around at different committees. Any information you need, let us know. What we expect by the end of today, um, either if I'm back or uh, probably Glenn or someone will get stuck with it, is a report out from each group. Uh, five minutes. Trevor, that's five minutes. Uh, <laughs> um, five minute report out. It's, a, it's critical that throughout this process, every group know what each other group is working on. And, and uh, for Brett Buckland and um, Winerowitz in particular, making sure we're connecting the dots so we're not uh, duplicating information. We'll have uh, reports from each group out. Everything's gonna be on the website unless there's something that is legitimately uh, kind of corrections confidential. And I say legitimately, we like to throw that around a lot, but some stuff, uh, you know, there's no reason why we all can't know it, especially everybody's working uh, for DOC, so we'll work through that stuff, share information. Again, I want to thank you um, for volunteering. We're having this meeting today. I anticipate most of the meetings in between will be by either video conference or hosted somewhere else. Um, one of the things I hear that we may actually have a budget in the next three or four weeks. Uh, if that happens, while it doesn't mean that we're going to get a bunch more money, uh, some of the travel restrictions will be freed up. Um, Field trips to other facilities within our system are uh, easily approved. If there's something going on really good in another system that's not too far away, we'll consider it. I know Hawaii's doing some good things, ain't gonna happen. Um, but with that being said, if there's other systems who are doing stuff and you need a connection, uh, we can certainly make that connection. And some of the adjacent states who are doing some good stuff, uh, you know, a, a DOC van and a couple overnights will probably not break the budget. This is as, as critical and as important uh, an effort as I've been involved in. Um, and, and I hope it's, you view it the same way. Um, so we got to you know, put our money where our mouth is, and our mouth is at reducing violence in our facilities. Um, so while you don't have a specific budget, we'll, we'll try to work some stuff out. Um, we're not sending 60 people uh, to Ocean City, Maryland, because they're doing great stuff either. So, um, but I appreciate your effort. Take a little break, get lunch, and um, get to work this afternoon. Thank you. <laughs>